Good. Good. Okay. Uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And I say that in earnest because I almost missed uh, this webinar. I just realized about seven minutes ago that Turkey was even one hour further ahead. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let that be a lesson. Uh, welcome to um, a next uh, our next talk. Uh, I have the utmost pleasure of introducing uh, today's um, speaker, although uh, honestly, she, she needs no introduction. Uh, Deidre Miklowski is an economist, a historian, and a public intellectual, and has written widely on topics ranging from economics to statistics, ethics, and theology. Her book, Bourgeois Equality, published in 2016, was the third in a, tri in a trilogy, uh, showing that liberty made for enrichment. Her nine 2019 book, Why Liberalism Works, applied her starting historical and economic findings to politics. She has recently uh, been uh, named on uh, the um, um, board of the Review of Political Economy. I am honored to introduce Deidre McCloskey. Hello, well, thank you, dear. I'm glad to be here in, in, in Turkey, though I'm actually in Chicago and you can see from the background that um, <laughs> I, I'm in the very unusual uh, um, part of Chicago that has a branch of the Grand Canyon of the Colorado mm. going through it. Um, I'd like to argue this afternoon that our that our uh, um, science of economics has a very unusual history in the last couple of centuries and a not altogether good history um, compared with other uh, uh, um, sciences like economics, I mean, sorry, like uh, uh, geology or history or even, even sociology um, or English literature for that matter. And it, it's, it's, it's very strange what's happened in economics. For the first hundred years of political economy, if we date that from the physiocrats in France till say, 1848, the, the practitioners, the thinkers about political economy, including French and, and um, English and Italian names especially, were coming to understand how overall a market economy operates. They did not achieve, even by 1848, quite the um, exquisite sophistication of uh, Aero de Bru, or uh, I don't know, Armin Alchian, or James Buchanan, or Hayek, or Paul S S S S Amielsen of the 20th century, but by 1848, many observers of the economy had a much clearer idea than say Aristotle did of how an economy worked. That, as, as we all know, was advanced further about um, 20 years later in the, the very um, striking um, triple invention of so-called neoclassical economics, uh, the, the, the three inventors of marginalism. Uh, but I would claim that around the middle of the 19th century, there was, so to speak, 
a clarity about what was good about a market economy. The great journalist and MP in France, Bastiat, was marvelously eloquent about this. And, and, and his thinking was typical of what political economy had achieved by 1848 or 1875, thereabouts. Then I say, the tragedy began, or we started into the era of, I would have to say decline in understanding how a market economy operated. The, uh, and, and it was a long, slow decline. It, it, it accelerated after the First World War and especially after the 1930s and the Second World War. But you can see it beginning to happen. This, how can I call it? This clouding over of the mind of economists, as indeed, as they started to call themselves economists instead of political economists, and got more precise and mathematical, which about which I have no objection, whatever. I don't think that's well. We'll we'll see, uh, but I don't have any. Um, D, I'm not making an argument against mathematics here. But as they became more mathematical, um, eventually more econometric, although that was very much at the end of the story. They, they came to understand the economy surprisingly less and less. The key word here is imperfections. And it's, it, it's a strange word to introduce into a science. Well, I, I suppose in, 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 in chemistry and physics, we can talk about the equation of state of an ideal gas, which by the way is an exact analog to our own MV equals PT in monetary economics. But ge geologists don't talk about perfect mountains or perfect continental plates or perfect erosion. And biologists certainly do not talk about perfect and imperfect evolution. And historians are a somewhat more mixed bag, but very often their, 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 their uh, claimed method is not to judge the past and certainly not to hold up perfection, some sort of ideal perfection as a standard with which to talk about actual kings and actual, actual, actual peasants. So there's something very odd going in on economics. I, I say even in sociology, which we economists are very inclined to um, think is an inferior science to our wonderful um, precise and mathematical science. No one in, in um, sociology, I think, and certainly not in anthropology, would talk about a perfect society. I mean, the clearer case is anth anthropologists would be horrified if um, some anthropologists were to say nowadays, especially, look, the um, this particular tribe is, is a perfect tribe compared with those other tribes that are imperfect. And if they were to hold up some sort of ideal, for example, Edward I of England was 
sometimes described, perhaps self-described, I imagine, but was sometimes described as a perfect king, as an ideal king of England. His reign began in, 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 in 1272. But so they would compare him with uh, some failed king like like Richard the Third, say, but they would then have now. Hear this. This is very important. These historians would have some factual, empirical basis for such a comparison. They would have numbers if they were quantitatively oriented or comparisons if they were qualitatively oriented that would give some meaning. You you could almost say some scale as though you were measuring to new temperature or something like that, along which to measure the perfectness of a king. But we don't have it in economics. And in an in a, in increasingly alarming and complete way, we fail in the last hundred years, especially over and over and over again to show that the latest imperfection is quantitatively or qualitatively. Again, it's, this isn't about math. It's not about econometrics, especially. We, we don't show the magnitude of the uh, imperfect, imperfection. Uh, uh, I suppose there is some blame here for to, to be assigned to mathematics because Valra, one of these three in, inventors of marginalism, um, thought in terms of a perfect market, which was then increasingly formalized, um, most particularly after World War II, um, as you know, infinite, <laughs> infinite number of traders of all had perfect knowledge. There were an infinite number of, um, of uh, contingent contracts. This is all Arrow de Bruce stuff. And Kenneth Arrow and Gerard de Bru and uh, others of their ilk, such as Frank Hahn, whom I also knew slightly, they, their purpose was to show how terribly imperfect the world must be. If in order to be a, to, for it to be to work according to their theorems, there would need to be an infinite number of traders, an infinite number of contingent contracts about the future, and so forth. Now, this is all, as I've said, very far from the scientific mentality of engineers or um, lawyers, for that matter, uh, but but certainly um, chemists or or uh, uh, historians or or genealogists, almost any scientific or quasi scientific field you can name has a way of, of um, speaking quantitatively, let's specialize on that, about how much things are, how big, how big is the biggest question in science? It would be extremely strange if a, say, let me go back to geology, which is a field. I, I had a course in geology in college, so I'm, I understand it a bit. Um, it would be extremely strange if a geologist were to offer a theory of, uh, let's see, of, um, of erosion of the Appalachian Mountains, one of the oldest 
mountain chains in, in the United States. That was not quantitative. That just said it rained and so the mountains were eroded away. You know, wait a minute. We're trying to explain why this mountain range, which was once once very tall, like the Rockies, I mean, a long time ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, got to be short, got to be small. And if you have a theory of how that happens, you say, well, you see, it's the rainfall. <laughs> then, of course, no responsible geological scientist would offer a theory of rainfall erosion without an estimate of how fast it works. Yet, I've compiled in a, in a paper that is circulating a list which I easily thought up, having being old and having been educated in lots of different parts of economics, um, that you all, I'm sure, can easily supplement a fully, now hear this, 108 imperfections found since Malthus. And Malthus, uh, Marx, and then since 1848, in, you know, in increasing volume, imperfections in the market. The bad taste of the laboring class, which was a common theme in the late 19th century. The uh, monopoly, which came to importance in economics at the very end of the 19th century. Uh, externalities, uh, which, which were declared to be very important by people like A.C. Um, Arthur C. Uh, Pigou in his famous book, The Economics uh, of Welfare. And in 1922, an economic historian like me, um, the professor of economic history at Cambridge, himself a student of Alfred Marshall, John um, Clapham wrote an important paper, which most economists have never heard of, called Empty Economic Boxes, in which he did a kind of review of, of Pigou's book. And in Pigou's book, the externality or the, um, the failure of the price system that Pigou was talking about was increasing returns. If there were increasing returns to the scale of an, of an industry, said Pigou, the government should subsidize that industry because the claim is that individual enterprises will not realize in both senses of the word, this externality. And so the wise men of, of London or Paris should step in and hand out cash subsidies to expand this industry. And Clapham pointed out in this very good essay, which I urge you all to read, <laughs> that in a thousand page book, by Pigou. Not once does he offer any criterion, quantitative or otherwise, but let's talk about quantitative criterion, which would allow you to decide that an industry had increasing returns. It was entirely, you could say, uh, qualitative. It was entirely, well, here's a diagram or a piece of math. And there are these uh, externalities. Uh, with the, uh, this isn't environmental externalities. It's another kind. But these um, non-convexities, as we learn to call them later on, and um, they exist. That's the favorite word. There exist consumer irrationalities. There exist tendencies 
to mass unemployment. There exist irrationalities in sharecropping. There exist, and it goes on and on and on. Mostly, these existent theorem 108 imperfections are fruits of the left of politics. Because unsurprisingly, the, the criticism of modern, the modern economy has come mainly from the left. Yet there are also a few of these imperfections that you might say come from the right or from even from liberalism, uh, understanding that as not being the right, but off of the scale of left and right. For, for example, it's an imperfection um, if, if property rights don't exist. And my good friend, the late uh, Douglas North, was famous for claiming that um, the, 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 that well, his, his version of it was their high transactions cost, which then are solved after um, 1689 in England, and then the modern world happens. Um, and that's an imperfection that Doug had never measured, <laughs> never gave any attention to its probable magnitude. Um, and none of his followers in the neo-institutionalist uh, school of Ashimoglu, a, a Turk who, by the way, will get the Nobel Prize soon, I think, um, or uh, um, Barry Weingast or, or, or any of the other followers of Douglas North, none of them offer quantitative evidence that the argument they're making matters. This is, I'm sorry to say, a scientific disaster. Now, I yield to no one in my affection for economists and economics. I've been in my lifetime, my long lifetime, all kinds. I've been a Marxist economist. I've been an economic engineer. I've been a Keynesian economist. I've been I've been I've been everything except a conservative, a European style conservative. That I've never been, but everything else. I've, now I'm. Uh, I, well, for a long while I've been getting more and more Austrian, uh, but now I, I I advocate humanomics, um, which is economics with the humans left in, uh, not behavioral economics, which does not let the humans in, but humanomics, which acknowledges philosophy, history, um, literature, um, uh, rock music, all kinds of things that, that, that uh, offer us insight into how the economy works. And in all these roles, I've kind of been stupidly quantitative. I, I've always uh, tried to um, offer um, standards by which you could say the economy is perfect or imperfect. For example, in Marxian economics, the great book, I believe, I always get its date slightly wrong, I think it's 1960, by um, Paul Baran and Paul um, Sweezy on the claim that they made of monopoly in the American economy. Sweezy, Baran and Sweezy, honorably, in a kind of science that I admire, attempted to quantify how much more monopolistic the American economy had become, because that's part of their, that was part of their Marxist story. So, but they're very rare. Um, I mentioned Cathero. Who was a who was a colleague of mine at Stanford, and an amiable man, a, a very excellent economist, a great economist, and he said that healthcare 
obviously had informational asymmetries that made it necessary for organizations like the Food and Drug Administration to intervene and to stop uh, you know, sales of drugs that don't, aren't uh, efficacious. Ken, who was in many ways, not just a mathematical economist, but a, a sensible person. For example, very early on, way before I got into it, Ken said that tests of statistical significance are idiotic. He said this in 1957, and he was correct. But so he was a he was a sensible guy, but he never offered any evidence. Zero, nada, niente, no evidence that this assert, this sort of foundational, factual assertion he was making was true. And so it so it goes. I mean, you get. Uh, uh, economists and um, uh, talking about the infant industry argument. And of course, this goes back to the 19th century and the, the German economist uh, uh, List, Friedrich List, and then it's taken up by, by Kerry in the United States and, and, you, and you still hear it. My friend, uh, Paul, 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 Paul David is fond of making the infant industry argument. He sees these um, non convexities all around it. Um, and <laughs> no one has offered any evidence that the infant industry argument is correct. The infant industry argument being that Turkey or, or uh, Brazil or someone, uh, some country needs to protect itself from the, from the terrible Americans or, or or, or British long enough so that its infant industries can become grown up. This is a uh, theory that uh, dominated Latin American um, economic policy for um, a long time now, 70 years by Ralph Prebish, the import substitution argument. And it's based on the idea that there's something imperfect that there's some sort of mistake that the economy makes. If you don't offer this protection to infant industries, and so it goes. I mean, I, I'm going to uh, stop in a few minutes. Speak, and, and are there only three people here? Is that right? Or are there more in the background? Okay, can someone answer that? Uh, there are people, Deidre, who are listening directly on YouTube. Oh, good. Okay, good. That, that's nice to hear. So I, I'm gonna I, 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 I'm, I'm gonna stop in a few minutes, and we can we can converse about this. Um, but here's an example. Here's an example that I work out in, in the paper that I'm circulating, um, and that's the, the, the that's something that that um, well, actually, before I start that, let me make a comment about behavioral economics on this score. Behavioral economics, the movement of the last 30 years or so of uh, redoing individual psychology to show that, that, that customers and everyone else are irrational um, uh, is, um, is, is an example of this. Because although you can show that cognitive, um, well, well, what do they call them? Um, anyway, mistakes in thinking are very common among humans. There's no showing in behavioral economics that these effects are big. My friend Bob Frank at uh, Cornell is a big enthusiast for these, these arguments. And I would, you know, Bob again is a very good economist. Um, he's he's another economist who deserves the Nobel Prize, although there are a lot of those. Um, and but he says, oh well, but there are these externalities, and so we need to nudge people. And he said to me once, "Don't you understand, dear? This is paternalistic libertarianism." And I said to him, Bob. What are you talking about? That's a contradiction in terms. But in any case, the idea is that uh, 
that people are stupid. And so, and now here the here the the <laughs> assumption, the empirical assumption being made here. And so the government needs to step in. Now, there are two big scientific quantitative questions that are not answered there. First, is the imperfection in individual rationality, which we all experience, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't regard myself as perfectly rational about anything for that matter, is that, does that have a substantial effect on the way the market works? Is the market driven far from a pretty good, reasonably good outcome? And one reason you might doubt that it, it is driven very far is that, of course, when there are these imperfections or these uh, irrationalities, there's an incentive for firms to develop that help people with the irrationality. One example is the rise of the department store, which is a century and a half old. The department store as an idea was in part, especially in some of its versions, such as Marshall Fields in Chicago, um, a, a, um, a, a, a guarantor of quality. And so you didn't need to be perfectly rational as a consumer because you went to Marshall Fields and Marshall Fields guaranteed that if you didn't like it, you could return it for a full cash refund. So that's one problem with saying, well, people are irrational, therefore the government has to step in. And the other problem is chronic in this and so the government has to step in, which applies to a lot of things, which is what makes you think the government is any more rational than the consumers? What makes you think, this is a point that James Buchanan and his whole school of public choice made over and over again, what makes you think that the government is gonna do a better job? I mean, you can assume the government would do a better job, but that's like A.C. Pigou assuming that we have here unnamed an industry that experiences increasing returns or assuming to make the old joke that we have a can opener. That assuming we have a can opener is not a scientific act. So I'm quite distressed by behavioral economics. And I think it has these two um, deep uh, uh, problems. But the example I, I give in the paper, it's some length, not too long, is the rise of monopoly, the rise of monopoly power, which figures in many of the um, 108 imperfections in one way or another. I, for example, was almost the last undergraduate student of Edward Chamberlain at Harvard, um, the inventor of monopolistic competition. And, and, and believe me, Chamberlain taught us <laughs> in price theory or microeconomics, taught us that book that he wrote, this one book he wrote um, about monopolistic competition. So I'm, I'm kind of an expert in the theory of monopolistic um, co competition. And I thought it was just grand when I was a kid, when I was 19, thought, boy, this is really smart. It's halfway between monopoly and, and this perfect ideal, um, infinite number of, uh, of traders competition. And boy, that's, that's realism. And it only very slowly dawned on me that Chamberlain had no evidence for it. No, no evidence that would stand up in court, so to speak, and certainly not the court of scientific, serious, quantitative scientific opinion. A, a physicist who talked the way Chamberlain did would be laughed out of, out of court. 
you, 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 you can't just say, well, there are atoms and there are molecules, but you know, there's something in between them. And I can't give you any evidence of it, but isn't it obvious that there's something that's kind of in between or halfway between molecules and atoms? People say, what are you nuts? Give what, tell me what you're talking about. Show me the numbers. So, the, so in, in many, many of these 108, and if you, you all read the paper, you, you, and if you have a wide um, a, a sort of experience of economics, you'll easily be able to add more examples to my 108 uh, uh, cases. Um, hyperbolic discounting, blah, 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 all kinds of things. Um, ma- Monopoly, the rise of monopoly figures in many, many of them. Now, I'm I'm an economic historian. And in my stupid way, as was Clapham, this guy I mentioned in 1922. And in our stupid way, we're we're kind of simple-minded, we economic historians. We actually want evidence for and if you if it's to the point, we want quantitative evidence for what you're arguing. Now, hear me. <laughs> Let's talk about the history of monopoly in, say, Britain, or for that matter, Turkey, or 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 anywhere. Let's let's t- t- talk about something I know well the history of uh, of Britain. Let's ask, what was the state of monopoly in 1800 or 1900 or 1960? Take those three dates, compare with now. Well, (laughs) over that period of two centuries, isn't it obvious that improvements in transportation and um, and and communication have massively reduced the power of local monopolies, and the non-local monopolies isn't it obvious from the same or similar causes have been reduced in power by international competition. When I was a kid, when I was young, there there were tariffs on imports of automobiles into the United States. And so we used to joke that there were three and a half automobile manufacturers in the United States, Ford, um, uh, Ford, General Motors, what's the other one? Chrysler, anyway, three and a half. Then we dropped the tariffs and suddenly looked out from the consumer's point of view, instead of having three and a half competitors, there are 20. You can buy a Toyota, you can buy a Volvo, you can buy this, you can buy that in a way that you couldn't in 1955. And on the transportation front, local monopolies of which surely in 1800, there were plenty, uh, were eroded by the coming of metalled roads as they call them, improved dirt roads. Then the railway, earlier, slightly earlier canals, then the, uh, the, 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 then the bicycle, then the automobile. J- j- just take the example of the of, of the bicycle, which started as a toy for rich young men. But as you know, rapidly here we do have um, increasing returns to industry scale, became the essential tool of the working class all over the world. Before the bicycle, 
people had to walk everywhere. Suddenly, they were able to find alternative suppliers for their rice or flour, and they were able to find alternative employment in, in the next town if they needed to drive there. And then came the automobile, airplanes, uh, and then in, in communication, obviously, the, the telegraph, the, um, the the, the telephone, radio, uh, um, the, uh, the internet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what's actually happened in the last two centuries, and you can take any period you want, and this will prove to be true, is a decline in the power or the, the, the importance of monopoly in the economy. And yet over and over again, People have said, ah, there's an imperfection that's caused by monopoly. And in comes monopoly and solves the economist's problem. In comes the can opener and solves the economist's problem. And as far as I can see, it's getting worse and worse. Um, the way you get a Nobel Prize is by dreaming up another one of these imperfections, not showing that it's important nationally, not showing that it substantially uh, changes the outcome that the political economists in 1848 had come to understand economies have. So am I, I say we've got to stop this. We've got to start demanding when someone offers still another imperfection, which the Nobel Committee will uh, uh, um, smile on in a few years, that they provide evidence that it's true. So there's been a, so to end, there, there was a rise of what you could call economic sophistication among economic scientists up to around 1848, came to its, in a way, its peak in the 1870s with marginalism. And then the imperfection, what would you call it, virus, <laughs> started to spread in the mind of economists. And finally, to, to truly conclude, consider how economic, uh, how economics is taught, whether it's micro, macro, industrial organization, international trade, whatever you want to name, economic development. Um, it's taught this way. In the first week of, say, a micro class, or say two weeks, you tell the students about supply and demand, about you know supply and demand curves, and, uh, and then you say, look at the intersection of these two curves. Things are it's in both in equilibrium, and arguably desirable. The 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 so-called invisible hand argument, but the rest of the course is devoted to one imperfection after another. And of course, the students think that their teachers must have had some scientific reason for adding still another imperfection, although the students might notice they probably don't, that there's no evidence attached to it. They, they, keep, they keep seeing this and they think, gee, boy, this economy works terribly badly. Now, here's how badly it's worked. While this was going on, while economic science was claiming that, oh my God, things are terrible. There's so many imperfections, 108, 120, 100. Oh my God, my God, how terrible. Uh, Allah Akbar, oh, this is awful. <laughs> this terrible economy with all these imperfections Increased since 1848 in countries like Japan or, or, or Finland, 
income per person in real terms, now hear the number, by 3,000%. Not a doubling, not a tripling, a factor of about 30. And this has been happening worldwide. It's now spread to China and India. The, this, what I call the great enrichment, which is a much more sensible term than the industrial re revolution, which is a very misleading term. The great enrichment, which is what it says, has been happening despite all these so-called imperfections. And the, the great enrichment you can also show didn't happen because the government intervened and fixed the imperfection. So in short, we've got to stop being non-scientists in economics. We've got to stop this um, crazy practice, which puts us in scientific um, integrity below most other inquiries into the um, physical or social, or for that matter, artistic world. So thank you. I'm all through. Yeah, thank you, Deidre. This, it was a, a, a very interesting talk. And what I was, first of all, if you don't have a journal for your paper, I would be very honored to publish it in the review political economy. And, you know, it really resonated with me because when, when I did my PhD at the new school, I did my macro and micro with John Eatwell. Sure. Um, John's interpretation was about these imperfectionist models. Sure. And, and when hearing you talk, I also, <coughs> kept thinking about Keynes. You know that famous quote of Keynes where he says that um, economists blame uh, the lines for not being parallel. Um, yeah. And this is, you know, this is imperfectionist modeling at its best, right? That's right, that's right. And um, there's a second comment that I wanted to, uh, speaking of Keynes, you know, um, when you were talking about the humanotics, uh, human nom approach, it reminded me of another quote of Keynes from 1924 mm -hmm. in his paper on Alfred Marshall, yes. when he says, you know, the master economist must possess a rare combination of gifts. That's he must right. be mathematician, historian, statesman, yeah. philosopher. And this is sort of what you were um, telling us. Yes. And yeah, and, yeah that's true. And the, I'm reminded of um, Andy Haldane. Now, Andy was, because he's left, the chief economist at the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. And a few years back, he created a lecture series, a lecture series at the Bank of England for economists. Yeah. And he brought in a violinist. <laughs> a potist. Good for him. Uh, a transgendered woman. Yay! Because uh, his idea was that economists can learn about life. Yeah, I agree with you. From listening to an artist. Well, my, 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 my father was a professor of, of political science at Harvard. And he had this very intelligent first year graduate student who came to him at the end of a very successful first year of graduate study in, in, in the PhD program and asked my father what he should read, the student should read over the summer before the second year. My father gave him a list of 30 novels. And that's right, that, <laughs> that's humanomics. And, you know, I, I, I'm in favor of specialization like every economist and they, they take away my, my union card if I say anything against it. But th then the, the argument is specialize, but then trade. Yeah. 
if all you do is specialize, you're not accomplishing anything. You have to be, you have to be uh, on trading with each other. So yeah, I, I wholly agree. And look, I, I, I think this point I'm making applies to the left and the right and the middle. It's not got any politics to it. I, I'm a, as you know, I'm a, I'm a 19th century liberal. And I, uh, you know, I, I was once a Marxist, but I'm no longer. And, and I was a Keynesian, as I said, I was a Keynesian. But th this is a problem in every part of economics. I agree. I agree. And um, I was very encouraged. But what, and then my next question was going to be, but then you answered it. Is it getting any better, you think? No. Has the COVID crisis sort of humanized our our understanding of no I, I think that I think that's kind of I I don't agree that 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 the COVID crisis is going to like uh, two thousand and eight I don't think either of the of of, of the, the crises um, should change economics I, I think there are certain fundamentals of economics opportunity cost general equilibrium. Um, uh, equilibrium and disequilibrium, as the Austrians would say, that are that are not going to change any more than the theory of evolution in its overall um, uh, structure is going to change, or or should change. Um, although it wouldn't hurt if economists became less arrogant, but what, what I do wish they would do is start um, assigning numbers. Speaking of the Bank of England. Last fall, I, got, I was on a Zoom call like this with the former uh, governor of the Bank of England. He was, he's Mark a, Harvey. that's right. He's a Canadian economist and he gave a talk. Um, and I said the same thing that I just said to you. I said, this is all very nice. And I didn't say it because I was in a position where I had to be more, more polite and was, as I always, always try to be. But it was complete nonsense because he didn't have any numbers for it. Yeah. He didn't. He said, oh, this is, this is, this is what happened and this is how, what's going to happen and blah, blah, blah. And it was all kind of um, airy-fairy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do we have more time or is this it, Oscar? Uh, Professor, we have a question. We have a question. Yes, sure. Three, four minutes, and uh, okay. we have one question. I wrote it the chat line. Uh, please read it and uh, answer it. Who is he? Yeah. Where is this person talking? Who's yes. reading the question? Yes, uh, the question is YouTube, our YouTube channel. I wrote it the, now, this chat line, Zoom chat line, you see now? Oh, the chat. You you want me to go to the chat. I'll be glad yeah, to. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, there's the chat. Uh, I said, thank you for a wonderful talk. Oh, I agree with that. So let's let's go on to the, no, no. That's, um, can some market imperfections be so obvious that economists don't bother to prove they exist empirically? Look, the problem there is the word existence. And we do this in econometrics too. We say, well, does it does is the standard error such that uh, of sample uh, sampling such that it meets the five percent um, significance level? Then we say the effect exists. That is wrong. <laughs> That's what Kenneth Arrow said in 1957. That's what I've been saying for now about 40 years. It's what the American Statistical Association for four for, for years ago in, a, in an official report said, the exist talk is this non-quantitative talk. And then he, he says, for instance, Google has a monopoly in the market for search engines. Well, that remains to be seen. <laughs> You've got to show me, yeah, look, you, you, you can't prove a, mon a monopoly in, the, in a bad sense or as a substantial deviation from supply and demand by just saying, well, look, it's got most of the market. 
that if if you if you said that, then you'd say Paul Samuelson long had a monopoly of elementary economics to the textbooks, and that was quite true. But it but it was not true. It was true in the sense that that Paul had a big share of the market, and then he got he got imitators, um, uh, and so his. Although he made a lot of money from it, he didn't go on making it forever. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, so no, uh, to prove it quantitatively is not enough. Even, even if it were true that this that there are no potential entrants to Google, which is not true. I mean, once there wasn't Google, do you remember that? And then Google entered, and it crushed many of the competitors, not necessarily illegitimately, but because it was better. That's why we use Google. Paul Samuelson's book was better than the competitors, say John Hicks's book, Ursula, John Hicks's book. So so the, the question of bad monopoly where the where the supplier has you by the throat that is a matter of potential entry. I was taught in the Harvard School that of this, uh, that's implied by this question of structure in, in, in industrial organization. That if, if somebody has, some company has a high share, that's an oligopoly or a monopoly or something like that. That's nonsense. The Chicago School approach is much better, which is to say, are there potential entrants? But, even if all that was taken care of, you still need to show that it matters for the economy as a whole. I don't mean just Google, that the, that the whole, that all the monopolies, and I would claim that all the monopolies in the economy have been declining for 200 years. So if monopoly was important in 1900, it's less important now, and you can you can actually calculate how much less important. So that's that's my answer to that. Thank you very much. I'm the, I'm, 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 I like to say I'm the answer li- lady. I have an answer to everything. If you're having problems in your in your love life, I can take care of that. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much for your valuable contribution to our symposium.